and uh, the energy that he puts out, <coughs> the energy that he puts out in order to hold on a thing. Um, this thing is is basically hugging up my whole screen. Don't know what's going on here, guys. One second. Something has gone awry. Okay, nothing is working on my end. Okay, I think I had to close this here. Got it. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, how much I totally regard Mark Agbeko and um, what he carries in God. Um, I am convinced that he is a legitimate prophet. <clears throat> he has the the word of the Lord in his mouth, and he has a very good, keen sense uh, to to discern and hear into and capture the mind of the Lord. I totally admire and I applaud his um his ambition. And that is, in some circles, that's a nasty word, a cruel word. But when I speak about ambition in this regard, it's the willingness to, to, to box above his weight class, to do things that may appear um, almost like uh, outside of his, 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 his orbit. He's willing to try things, willing to do things, willing to give God options, willing to create a context for God to do things in his life, in his nation, in his region, and among people wherever he has some degree of influence over. So I want to commend Mark for what he's doing here. Um, I was unable to <laughs> join in on the previous sessions, but I've heard only remarkable reports. I heard good reports on uh, Dave Cropper's presentation. I have, a, I have a sense as to what that presentation entailed. And so I want to encourage all of you to kind of um, go back, reconsider, and think about ways in which you could create teams that will bring influence in your separate regions based on what Dave had to share. Um, Charles Opio um, sent me his presentation from last evening. I kind of mulled through it a little bit, didn't really kind of uh, do a detailed look, but the little I looked at, it was enough to convince me that it was a very, very significant session. Uh, and so <clears throat> let me commend all of the speakers who have gone before. And tonight, as we always do on platforms such as these, we want to explore and examine the word of the Lord and then uh, open up for some degree of interaction. Um, I want us to think, as always, let us have some really profound thoughts. <clears throat> I'm hoping that on this platform, we have young businessmen, entrepreneurs, uh, people who are willing to to really take the the severe jump into areas of creativity and innovation and thoughtfulness. What I want to do tonight or this evening is to explore simple scripture, one that we've read time and time again. But I want us to look at around eight or so principles, seven principles, I think, <clears throat> in terms of wealth creation. Um, and so, I'm talking about the whole issue of exploring wealth creation. This is a big, big issue because um, <clears throat> all over the world, I mean, we now have 8 billion people upon the planet, but the majority of those 8 billion people come from very poor and impoverished regions. Africa for a long time, though it is rich in mineral resources, it is still considered to be a poor part of the planet, one of the poorest parts of the matter of fact. Um, I've been to several parts of Africa. I've been to Burkina Faso. I've seen poverty up close and personal. I've gone to areas of the Congo, uh, both Brazzaville, Congo, French and Belgium, Congo. <clears throat> I've been into, into the different parts of Africa from the extremely affluent to the very, very poor. I've been around India. I've seen poverty in, in some real uh, heartbroken areas. I've gone into areas of Haiti. I've been to Haiti several times. And so <clears throat> I've been to different parts of the world where I've seen poverty firsthand. And so the issue of wealth creation is a big concern, particularly as we as the planet or as the as the world continues to <clears throat> accelerate in areas of, um, of um, in terms of birth rates. We have quite a number of people on this planet. The big question is whether the earth has enough food to sustain the 8 billion people that now reside on this dot. Outside of the 
big, big conversation. It has the small conversation, which is more closer to home. Um, how are we able, in your own space, how are you able to survive? <clears throat> and for far too long, Christianity has more or less um, focused on areas that we always thought were very, very, very important. And we seem to ignore other areas that are even more important in the context of how I see God designed the world. And so we could no longer sweep things under the carpet and ignore them. We have to face them head on. And so I want us to talk a little bit about the whole issue of exploring wealth creation. And this is a topic I want to build on, talk more about, um, explore even more deeply uh, in going forward. It is a consideration I'm hoping that maybe in January or, or February of next year, that we could do a, a masterclass in areas of wealth creation on a bigger level, just to expand it on all kinds of levels. On this particular presentation today, I'm kind of um, going at a slow pace and looking at some very, very, very simple concepts without expanding on much of them. So I'm, I'm trusting your own, your own perspective and your own insight and your own development. So let's look at this scripture that we know all too well. Second Kings chapter four, <laughs> one to seven. This is the NIV translation. And follow this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditors, now his creditor is coming to take my two sons as his slaves. Elisha replied to her and said, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She replied and she said, your servant has nothing there at all except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all of the jars, as much as is filled, as much as, as much as, as, and as each is filled, sorry, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were filled, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied and he said, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went. And she told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. <laughs> now, this is a very simple story, but there are several uh, rudimentary principles inside of it. How many of us find ourselves in a situation where our need is far greater than our income? How many leaders are sitting on this conversation? <laughs> Who, ha who happen to have a vision that is far more expansive than the trickling amount of resources that are coming in into your churches, whether it be Sunday morning or whenever you gather. How many big dreams are being compromised because of limited or lack of resources? And so when I talk about wealth creation, it is a conversation that we have to seriously consider in going forward. Why? Because the more you read the book of Revelations and the more we get into eschatological conversations, as we near the culmination of human events and as we near the, end of, and as we near the culmination of divine intentions, the issue of money, business, entrepreneurship, they all become very serious conversations because we all know from eschatological speaking that, listen, there comes a day when we won't be able to buy or sell those are, con those are concepts in commerce. You won't be able to buy or sell. Those are economic language. You won't be able to buy or sell. That's language of trading and bartering unless you have the mark of the beast. And so this is not a mark of the beast conversation. This is an economic conversation. It's a business and wealth creation conversation. And so if business, entrepreneurship, marketplace, money, and economics are major, major conversations in the day of the end. We can't wait until it begins to rain to start building an ark. And so we can't wait until we literally, right in front 
of if right, right a few seconds away from the culmination of all things and we start to have this conversation we have to start to build the boat now in anticipation of a day of rain and so this particular situation happening with this woman uh identifies several things that i want us to explore let's talk about it and eight principles it's really eight i was saying nine or seven eight principles for altering your state and um and we're going to describe what i mean i'm going to look at eight of them and my intention this evening is not to speak for three hours or four hours. I just want to have this conversation, then open up for dialogue. I'm hoping that the interaction would be far more buoyant than the presentation, because all I want to do is to at least um, create a context for a conversation. This is called advanced kingdom conversation. This is not advanced kingdom presentation. This is an advanced kingdom conversation. Conversation is a critical part of it. Let's look at eight principles for altering your state. So I'll start very simply with number one. Remember the story, because we have to go back. As a matter of fact, let's go back and read the story again. And as you read it, please underline, underline the salient parts in it. We all know how to discover truth in the word of God. We've been around the apostolic impartation long enough that some of us can actually see the principles before they're even mentioned. Because after a while, you have learned the technology of discovering concepts. So let's read this again and take note, identify concepts. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. And this is what she said, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord and now his creditors is coming to take my two sons as his slaves. Elisha replied to her and said, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around, ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few, then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all of the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind her, and her sons, they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring when all the jars were filled, she said to her son, bring me another one. And he replied and he said, there's no, there's no more jars left. Then the oil stopped flowing. The oil stopped flowing. And that's important. Eh? Hold that thought in your heart. Hold that thought in your mind. The oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can now live on what is left. In other words, this woman went from poverty to oil business. She went from nothing and she basically stepped into OPEC um, with, with, with great authority. She moved from nothing into oil and gas business in an instant. What caused that massive transition where her state was altered? First principle, her husband was a son of the prophet. Now I wanna explore these principles very simply. Follow this. This is not a hollering and screaming environment. By now you know that. This is a conversation. Her husband was a son of the prophet. She said uh, uh, a woman, the Bible starts by talking about a woman whose husband was a son of the prophet, meaning that this woman, this particular guy, um, was in fact a part of the school of the prophets. So the language there, if you have, based on what translation you have, this woman's husband was one of the sons of the prophets, which was the language associated with the graduates, those who came out from the school of the prophets. Samuel started a school of prophets way back in his day. And there's a lot, a lot of information about the school of the prophets that I want you to examine and explore. But listen, the first principle is that her husband was a son of the prophet. Language that would suggest that he was trained at Samuel's school of the prophets in all things expedient. Now, I want you to identify on underscore all things expedient. Very important point I want you to capture here and follow me. Because we think that the school of the prophets was a place where people went and tried to understand how to prophesy. Where people went and learned how to hear the voice of God. I did some research and this was not 
your traditional concept of where people came and they get sensitized to prophesying and they listen to some music and try to understand some of the nuance and buried into the music or they look at a picture and try to discover hidden realities inside of there. Those are wonderful training concepts. But when you went to Samuel School of the Prophet, you were not just schooled in the areas of prophetic functionality. Historians say that the sons of the prophets were trained in a wide range of sciences, wide range of sciences, four specific areas. They were trained in vocational sciences. When I say vocational sciences, they, these guys knew how to build houses. They were artisans in every sense of the word. Remember there was a time when the sons of the prophets it came to Elisha and they said to him, the place where we are, it is too small. Let us go and build a place where we can meet. Observe, they did not say, let's go and hire someone who could build a place for us. These guys were significantly skilled. They had competence. They could have used their hands. They knew how to build. You know that story when they were actually, they went and borrowed an ax and they were cutting these trees down and the ax fell in the water, all kinds of stuff. But Deeply embedded in the story is the fact that these guys who went to the school of the prophets, they were not just being trained in spiritual matters, they were being activated in vocational competencies as well. These guys were schooled in technical skills, they knew how to handle a screwdriver, they knew how to use a router, they understood how to use a trowel in very real practical stuff. Now, most people don't consider those issues because you know what? I'm a man of God. I, I should not be um, concerned about those minor details. And you get into Acts chapter six and you begin to think, well, you know what? As a man of God, I would leave those minor things for the more insignificant peasants. And I would engage myself in the word of God and prayer. Maybe our reading of Acts chapter six is contributing to the overwhelming sense of incompetence that most people run around with. In the school of the prophets that Samuel had, people were schooled in the areas of vocational sciences. Secondly, they were trained in natural sciences. Natural science means that they understood physics. They understood how animals behaved. You understand there was a time when the Bible spoke about people like Daniel, who were in the, Daniel who was in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. It talks about how these guys were skilled in science. Where did they get that from? What was the area of training? It was clearly understood that Samuel's school of the prophets were not, was not just concerned about teaching people how to read a scripture and to deconstruct passages and to understand how to make an elder and all this kind of stuff. These people were equally trained in areas of natural science. They were also trained in social sciences. Social sciences would be deal with areas of economics, would deal with areas of relationship, would deal with areas of culture would deal with areas of civics. Those were other areas that these prophets were equally schooled in. And more than that, they were trained in spiritual sciences. I want you to realize that Samuel committed himself to a broad, comprehensive, holistic system of development, that a man of God in Samuel's perspective was not a graduate from a theological seminary who only understood how to read a Bible and had no knowledge of anything else. What Samuel was going after in terms of raising up a prophetic company in Israel, he was after raising up people who were literally complex, multidimensional, diverse, and highly productive. Because you take a man walking in those four sciences and you're dealing with a serious, lethal individual on the planet. So the school of the prophets were focused on these four areas. Now, these were some of the subject matters. They dealt with areas of ethics, temperance, and etiquette stuff that I think many men of God need to learn again today because uh, some of the most unethical people I've ever interacted with happens to be Christians and more so happen to be pastors. Some of them have no sense of etiquette, how to conduct themselves. They don't have any balance in their lives, no sense of temperance. In those schools, they taught poetry and morals and music. They also taught areas of technical skills. As I said, they must have taught areas of carpentry, basic things. There are some pastors who, who don't even know how to hold a screwdriver, how to even put on a door lock or to fix little things in their homes. Some of them are so big and grand and popular that they have to call uh, maybe their, what do you call them again? They are terms that they use to, as helpers. Most preachers have them. They talk about, forget the word, uh, uh, um, what is it by... Um, 
uh, forget the term, but but they have all of these and helpers that are there to to do almost everything for them. Some men of God can have, hardly even button their own pants without some one of these guys running there to to help them because they're just totally unskilled, totally incompetent. At Samuel School of the Prophets, they were taught in areas of law, justice, history, science, and wisdom, and they were equally schooled in understanding and partnering with the all-pervading power of the Spirit. Now, what do you see inside of it? What do you see? So when this woman said to Elijah, I mean, your servant, my husband, who was a son of the prophet, she was describing a lethal human being on the planet. And that's an important point because we would see how all those things basically connect. So what is important for us to capture here? Now, part of the problem with, the pres with present day Christianity is what I call one dimensional approach to empowering. Most preachers, it is almost impossible for the average believer to walk in areas of extreme competence if we continue to have church the way we do it. This is quickly becoming a dying breed. It is impossible. It is almost like you have a six cylinder car and all you are servicing every week is one cylinder. The other five are left unattended. Because in our minds, the other five is for the world. You know, you want to go to the university to address these issues. You have to go to, to maybe to work to get the other issues. And so we are now talking about wealth creation to a church. If it continues along its current trajectory, is destined to be irrelevant, is destined to be poor, is destined to be constantly begging, is destined to be asking for six and seven offerings on a Sunday morning, because our model is literally betraying our philosophy. It is impossible because we have a one-dimensional approach to empowering. Because in our minds, all we need to do, like the Gnostics be believed, all we have to do is to get people all switched on in their spirits, and we ignore the areas of their souls and the areas of their body. Important point. The word holiness is not a word that defines how long your dress is or how, or how, um, or how much your hair is covered or how modest you may dress. Now, please dress modestly. But the word holiness comes from the word holistic, meaning that all areas are covered. What we call holiness is basically a one-dimensional caricature. We are very spiritual, but we are very dysfunctional in the areas of our soul and in the areas of our flesh or our manhood. Listen to me. It is impossible, impossible for us to break into the areas of wealth creation, wealth management, if we continue to build our churches and build our people with this one-dimensional approach. Hear me. The one-dimensional approach has resulted in several things. Now, we could this list could be as expansive as ever, but the one-dimensional approach to this thing results in what I call a catatonic church possessed with lazy minds. Catatonic is a person who almost is in a state of shock. They are dazed. There's no understanding. They're almost like stupefied. They are constantly almost in a state where they're just getting awake. Catatonic is that state that you're in where somebody uh, shakes you out of sleep and you're not fully awake. You're almost like in an, in, a, in an unconscious little zone. And so what we have is a bunch of catatonic believers possessed with lazy minds. Let me give an example of lazy minds. I would just, if I were to speak to you about four or five concepts and I open for interaction, more often than, that, than not, nobody thinks they throw a scripture verse at you. And so very often you hear people say, it reminds me of this scripture verse. No, lazy minds. All you're doing is throwing another scripture at me, but you have not thought. There's no thinking because this one dimensional approach to the faith has resulted in a catatonic church possessed with lazy minds. It has resulted in a compelling preoccupation with irrelevance. So Sunday morning, what we call worship, these are serious topics that I am, I am dealing with on a, on a personal level. What we call worship is nothing more than what I define as, as, as emotional grooming and ambiance grooming. So what we call worship is creating the ambiance that caters to our def definition of God is here. Our definition. So if you go to a church of God in Christ who believe that shouting and screaming is the evidence of the anointing, man, they'll be hollering and jumping and screaming because that is their concept of God is here. 
You go to a charismatic church where that hushed environment is the, is the context in which we believe God is there. And so you're constantly grooming the environment and you are manufacturing an environment that caters to your definition of what the anointing is. And more often than not, God is not even there. Like Elvis, he left the building a long time ago, but we have to be constantly manufacturing a space that caters to our definitions. So this one dimensional approach has created a community or a church that has this compelling preoccupation with irrelevance. Now we could go on and on on that particular issue right there. What, has, what, what did we create? We, it resulted in incompetence. We have become very incompetent at alleviating the problem, but we are extremely gifted in exacerbating the problem. Take note of those words, alleviate and exacerbate. In other words, we can't get rid of it. What we do, we are constantly contributing to actually making it grow and become worse. So you look at the American situation with all of the, 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 the polarized, the polarized uh, political environment. You know who is now contributing more than anybody else to that polarized environment and all of the, the, the QAnon and, and uh, all of the different theories and craziness? The greatest contributor to that madness is the white evangelical church across America. Why? Because that's what we do. We are very, very good at exacerbating the problem, totally incompetent at alleviating it. What has this particular process produced? It has produced what I call uh, evolution in reverse. Because as I said, if we continue along this path, this church is destined to become extinct. We will continue to build in a way that we will lose our young people. And the only people who will populate our buildings would be the old and somewhat aged. So we are basically catering for the 50s to the 80s. And all of the people after that or before that, sorry, they want nothing to do with this stuff, you know. The generation X, Y, and Z, they are gone. They had enough of this nonsense. They have seen through the whole thing and they could no longer be motivated by this order because the one dimensional approach has resulted in evolution in reverse. We are not developing, we are constantly deconstructing and falling apart. As I've said in some contexts, we have used the, we have, we have the Jenga block philosophy. In other words, we are we are constructing by deconstructing. Every block you move and the thing does not fall apart, you are almost like glad that it has not literally crumbled as yet. So we are building with a deconstructing kind of mentality. Evolution in reverse. The one dimensional approach has caused a rabbit brand, a rabid brand. When I say rabid, from the, from the word rabies, that the thing is toxic that people who get inflicted with Christianity today is as though their whole life become toxic and poisoned and diseased. And they fall within the same category of being catatonic and thoughtless. What that one dimensional approach has created, it has created a church that is terrible at adulting. In other words, we can't grow up, but we are constantly sidestepping the ever expanding frontiers of the kingdom. Terrible at adulting. We, con we continue to fight and wage war. How many persons on this call and people that you know were members of organizations who came out hurt, wounded, bruised by your own friends, your own brothers? How many marriages were compromised because your own spouse basically crippling the whole agenda of the kingdom? Because listen, we struggle not with quoting scripture, not by shaking and lifting our hands and saying hallelujah, but we struggle with adulting just growing up and acting mature, and we are constantly sidestepping the principles of the kingdom. And what are we good at? What have we created? I want you to get this word. The word is called vexion. We have created vexion. Vexion is what I call the illusion of movement. Have you ever sat in a car before? You are, your car is going nowhere. You are sitting in your car, and you suddenly see another car moves at the side of you, and with the movement at the side of you, you are fooled into believing that you are moving. I'm sure you would have had that experience before. That experience is called vexion. It is the illusion of movement. So you go to some church and say, God is moving and we are advancing. The truth is you are going nowhere, but you are defining your movement based on whatever is happening around you. So you are in a standstill position, but there's some movement happening in the political environment, movement happening in the economic environment, movement happening basically in the job creation environment. And you interpret 
movement based on what you are seeing around you, being fooled into believing that you are moving as well. It's called the illusion of movement. And most churches are lost in that zone. That one dimensional approach has resulted, and this is such an important point, what I call collective sentiments guiding a misguided perspective. Now you could write that down because it's so important. What do I mean by a collective sentiment guiding a misguided perspective? You know, you read in the book of Haggai that Haggai said, you people say that the time to build the house of God is not yet, meaning that the majority defines what is approved. The majority define what is appropriate. So if a large cross section of Christianity says, this is the time for the apostolic, what we have is what I call the collective sentiments guiding a misguided perspective. And few people have the ability to listen through the noise and hear God for themselves. To be like John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, what we have created by the one dimensional approach to Christianity, we have, we, we have created a collective sentiment guiding a misguided perspective. And so now those principles there are by no means exhaustive. The point I want you to understand is this. When Samuel started the school of the prophets, he was not building a one-dimensional pastor. He was not building a one-dimensional believer. He was not he was not inundating his Sunday school with another story of David and Goliath. He was building a very complex, very diverse human that could bring meaning to life. We, on the other hand, we have created this caricature version of the faith that is one dimensional and schizophrenic at best. And we cannot continue to talk about wealth creation when our very model betrays the very philosophy. Somehow we have to start in our churches in Ghana and wherever we are, how we empower people must change. We have to complexify it. And you could see the day, you could see what I mean by a catatonic church. You go to a church and you holler and scream and people with you, you know, you begin to speak to them very philosophical. You, you speak to them very on very philosophical terms. You speak to them on very profound, real concepts. They fall apart. They sleep. They can't, they can't keep, keep their attention because what they want is the one-dimensional. The moment you try to broaden their perspective and kind of fire up their other cylinders, they, you lose them. And so we need to expand on these issues. Listen to me for them. Listen to me. Now, Samuel founded the school of the prophets to serve as a barrier against the prevailing corruption. You have to understand the context in which this was formed. So I'm, I'm doing all of this just for you to understand. When this woman said, my husband, who was a member of your school, she is not describing some weakling. She's not describing some petty individual. You see the wealth that she enjoyed at the end? You have to understand where it came from. There's something going on here that is uh, bigger than just she finding a vial of oil. This man did not just die and leave her with nothing. He was living in a different zone. Samuel founded the school of the prophets to serve as a barrier against the widespread corruption. You have to understand the context in which Samuel came on the scene eh, with, with Eli and his corrupt sons. You have to understand that Samuel came on the scene when the glory of God had departed. There was an Ichabod pronounced over the whole corporate order of the body of Christ and the church or Israel. And it is in that context that Samuel started the school of the prophets. Now, think with me, and you'll understand why this school was so critical in the development of a certain type of human, given the context in which that school was created. This was not an arbitrary school. This school was a serious place of human development. I'll say it again. Samuel founded the school of the prophets to serve as a barrier against widespread corruption. This was, the, this was its intent. It was intended to provide, it was, it, was, it was basically created to provide or exist for a moral, as a moral and spiritual warfare against the prevailing Ichabod. This school was supposed to be a statement of moral and spiritual warfare against a prevailing environment that says God is gone. There is no more God here. It has nothing happening. The corruption of these boys who were stealing the offerings and taking the best for themselves and abusing the people, all of that stuff, that is what defines current day Christianity. That is what defines the world in which we exist. And so Samuel started a school that was supposed to be a statement of moral and spiritual warfare against a prevailing Ichabod. This school was designed to promote the nation's 
future prosperity because listen, this thing cannot be switched on now. This guy had a long-term vision. The prevailing madness and the foolishness and the abuses and the extremity require that they start now to fix a problem down the road. Because let's face it, we cannot talk about having a bank as, as a Christian community because you know what? That thing is still, it has too much corruption and ego and madness. If we do it in our present context, we will fall into the same morass. However, we need to start putting the infrastructure in place to have that fully operational in the not too distant future. Because when Samuel started the School of the Prophets, his intent, intention was to promote the nation's future prosperity by furnishing the nation with men qualified to act with broad range competence. Men, from, men basically qualified to act in the fear of God as spiritual leaders and spiritual counselors. And that's a very important point as well. The school of the prophets was not just designed to raise up a prophet, not just designed to raise up somebody who could hear the voice of God and say, thus saith the Lord at the end of its sentence. This was designed to promote the nation's future prosperity. The environment of Ichabod had that environment continued for more years then the whole agenda, the economic agenda of God would have been compromised. Listen to me further. The School of the Prophets, this significant agency assured the nation of an all-encompassing buoyancy, all-encompassing. This was not just the ability to make sacrifices and sing songs. This guy was putting in place a system for the nation to enjoy all-encompassing buoyancy and prevailing strength despite the downturn brought about by the incompetence and the sinfulness of the priestly class. That is the context in which the school of the prophets existed. The school of the prophets was designed to be a massive agency that will act as a barrier against the widespread corruption, dysfunctionality, incompetence, etc. I am saying that if we are talking about economic, if we are talking about economic creation, wealth creation, job creation, within the wide body of Christ, we have to start thinking about changing the way we teach, changing what we, what we teach, and bring people into a broader stream of competence. Listen to me further. This is the other point about the School of the Prophets. Like the city of refuge, cities of refuge, those of you who ever studied the cities of refuge, the cities of refuge were scattered all over Israel both in the Northern Kingdom and in the Southern Kingdom. Like the cities of refuge, the school of the prophets was scattered throughout the Southern and Northern Kingdom. Three for each kingdom. It had three in the Northern tribe, three in the Northern Kingdom, and three in the Southern Kingdom, and they existed both before and after the Jordan. In other words, most of us define the Jordan as the jump from immaturity to maturity, from lack to possession. Now, if you put it in that particular context, you'll understand that God built systems for the immature as well as the mature. He built systems that no matter where you are, no matter where you are in Israel, there was an opportunity for you to come into life. So in Israel, it had these cities of refuge. And the cities of refu refuge were designed in such a way that if you were to commit a crime and was not done intentionally, an unintentional crime, then you could run to the nearest city of refuge to find help. The cities of refuge were designed in such a way that the path had to be cleared. There had to be removal of all the stumbling blocks. So if I were to commit a crime unintentionally, the path between me and my safety must be unencumbered. I must run to the nearest city. And so God had these six cities scattered all over Israel. So no matter where you live, whether you came from Judah, whether you came from Issachar, whether you came from Dan, wherever you came from, you had access to some city of refuge within close proximity to where you are. Now, in the same way, God built, Samuel built this, the, 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 the school of the prophets. There were six schools, both when Israel was a unified nation and after the nations were divided into the northern and southern kingdom, there were schools of the prophets. Listen to me. You'll understand the wisdom of Samuel here. There were six locations where these prophetic guilds existed. Remember a time when Elisha, I think it was, when he grabbed the mantle of Elijah, he was crossing the Jordan and he struck the Jordan with his coat and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? That is basic evidence to prove that it had schools on one side of the Jordan and the other side of the Jordan. 
there were six locations where these prophetic guilds existed. They were in Rama, they were in Bethel, Gilgal, Jericho, Carmel, and Samaria. And each of those schools had one fundamental concept. Listen to me. All these schools were within easy reach to every tribe, making it less of a prophetic training or a church-specific plaything, but it was more a national, educational, and transformational initiative. It was available to everybody, not just as a prophet. You didn't have to be a prophet. Samuel scattered the school in every locale. So if you were from, from Dan, you could find access to a school. Whether you were from Issachar, you could gain access to a school. Samuel utilized the same model of the cities of refuge and built six schools of the prophets inside of all Israel. He was not engaged in some church dynamic. This guy was in a transformational initiative. First question is, how does our current church model provide a school of the prophets dynamic that will break the current system of poverty, that will, create, that will break the current trajectory of the global church? How can we change the model that we utilize and the one dimensional approach to bring people into wholesome life. Very important. Second point, second point. Now I'm gonna pull this all together because you'll understand that this woman was not describing, well, that was a worthless man. He jump around and he'd scream and preach. That guy came from good stock, came from good stock. So when she eventually found just some oil in the house, you had to understand that there represented this man's legacy. She believed she was left with nothing but a guy who went through that, those level of training and sciences, he thinks differently. And you believe you have nothing, but look a little bit deeper. This man left you a lot more than you think. But if you have a religious perspective, you'll be looking for something differently. But this man left something. The second point she said is this, your servant, my husband. Your servant, my husband. I want you to realize what I call the need to prioritize your relational ripples. To prioritize your relational ripples. Now, note very clearly, note clearly, she said, your servant, my husband, she placed her husband's prophetic partnership above his familial co covenant. She didn't say my husband, who happens to be your servant. No, she said, your servant, my husband. In other words, this man takes his joining to you far more seriously than he takes his joining to me because his joining to me has value because of the resource that he gets from you. Something that you do, Elisha, brings this man into a broad, expansive world. And so I'm aware of that. I understand she's saying that you, whatever you carry in God, it defines our family. It defines the man's perspective. It defines his God view. It defines his worldview. It changes the way he thinks. It changes the way he talks to me and the children. And so she said, your servant, my husband. The principle is very clearly, very clear. That is, oh, sorry, I'm going a little bit too far there. Too fast, no, nope. but anyway, you'll get it. Yeah, something went wrong. I kind of pressed something I should have. represents God. So somehow I think in, um, in designing, I must have put something wrong and so it came out a little bit too soon. But the ever expanding ripples, God at the set, at the, at the, as the yellow, and then your impartational connection comes next, then self. Now you'd realize I don't subscribe to people's definitions. People say God, then church. No, I, that, that, I, I think differently. Your impartational connection, self, spouse, children, parents, siblings, and that those ripples could go on and on and on and on. But it's the ability to identify the priorities within your relational orbit. What does it look like for you? Some people are, form, are far more loyal to an organization than they are to an impartational competence. This woman says, your servant, my husband. I understand the order here. I understand. He places, he places my husband, and we do. We place priority on the impartation that comes from you. That is a massive principle. Now, People have abused that, huh? let's face it. 
how many apostles run around and, and literally um, receive sufficient narcissistic juices from their little sycophantic followers. And they could talk this principle, you know? I mean, my God, you have to know the God of Anderson Williams and the God of this one. And we have pushed these principles to the point where it justifies our abuse of people. But whether it is abused or not, there is a fundamental principle that this woman understood that sometimes you have to understand the priorities within your relational ripples. What comes first and what comes next? What does it look like? How do you manage that? Because impartation is critical. Let me talk around that point of impartational priorities, the impartational stream being a very critical starting point for your own movement into, into serious substance. Here, what? This is Romans here. This is Paul talking, speaking to the church in Rome. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Interesting. Um, Paul uses a plural word, plural term to describe a singular impartation. It doesn't say some spiritual gifts, a, some spiritual gift. In other words, this is like a, it is almost like, 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 a, a, um, like group nouns. Like it's like a group of things. It gets so much coming from one powerful impartation. I want to impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. This, in other words, be sensitive, be aware of this reality that I planned many times to come to you, but I have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I may have a harvest among you, just as I have among other Gentiles. Now, this is Paul talking to the church in Rome about the issue of wanting to come and impart. The point you have to understand is that impartation exists in the environment of very up close and very real relationships. When Paul said, I long to be with you, I long to see you, One, the King James says, I long to be with you, meaning that impartation really does not occur uh, at a high voltage level if relationships are not proximate and real. So when Paul talks about being with you, think about proximity, think about being close. Now we know that today I am speaking to you in the United States in New York City, and you are down in Ghana. But though there is geographical distance, there's a level of relational proximity that Mark, um, Mark Agbeck when I share. And so that's what I mean, proximity. I long to be, utilize that, look at that word and think about proximity, proximity. Impartation works best in an environment of proximity. And that's a critical point right there. The other point I want you to understand is this. I long to be with you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you might be established. Let's pull about three other principles out of that and let's um, see how we could get some value out of this, right? So um, principle, note the efforts and note the consistency and the constancy to prevent what I call impartational junction. Impartational junction basically means that impartation occurs where I give and you receive. Impartation is not one-way traffic. It has to be the, the meeting, the joining of efforts. So I call it impartational junction. So Paul says that, I, he said, please don't be, don't be insensitive to this. Don't be unaware, brothers, how many times I wanted to come to you, but I was prevented. One translation says, I was constantly prevented. In other words, the one thing that the devil wants to shut down is not relationship. You can have all the relationship you want. You could sing, dance, and hang out together. You can go and have a meal. What he wants to shut down between Paul and these guys in Rome is the impartational component. You can have good friendship, but you never create the junction, the fusion, the point where both meet in order for resource to be transferred from one to the other, that impartation junction. Paul said, I do not want you to be unaware. The point he's making is be sensitive to this reality that the devil doesn't mind you and I having a good conversation and having a good relationship. What he wants to do is to shut down the impartational junction where your heart and the impartational frequency can dynamically meet. Observe the efforts and observe the constancy to shut down that particular junction. Observe also, impartation provides strength. Impartation is not concerned about giving you nice ideas. You see, impartation is a real issue. Remember the woman said, your servant, my husband, I understand the order. I know that if this thing moves into his husband, into my husband, the thing comes into all of our lives. If this thing can only, if that junction is created, we all getting value, you know, 
because she understands impartation is not designed to give you a message to preach. It is not designed to give you a new slant in understanding biblical concepts. Impartation is not to give you a wow, never saw that before. What impartation does, it gives you strength. That's the NIV translation. The Greek word is sterizo, and it means load-bearing capacity. It means that you're a pillar. You could put weight on you and you could hold things. You could carry serious responsibility. You're not fickle and weak and falling apart. Impartation gives you internal capacity. And that is a serious thing because this has little to do with your understanding of Greek and Hebrew and subtext and all this stuff. You know, he said, I long to be with you that I may impart to you some spiritual resource so that you will be strengthened. The King James says that you will be established sterizo, that you will have load-bearing capacity, that you won't be some weak little believer who could sing on Sunday morning and clap his hands wonderfully and be an elder or an usher or a member of the worship team, but you can't put no weight on them. They are weak and fickle. They are only functional within the four walls of a church service. Paul said, what I want is to connect with you, not for a nice relationship, but for impartation. I want an impartation junction to be created where movement of resource can occur from me to you. What that does, it gives you load-bearing capacity. The other point is this. Paul then defines what strength is. He said, I long to be with you that I may strengthen you to the end of that both you and I could stand together and share our faith together. This is the point. Strength is evidenced in mutuality commonality and equality. And that is such a powerful concept. Paul said that if I come to you and I impart to you some spiritual gift and you are strengthened to the point that you and I could then share our faith together, the point of impartation is always designed to bring you up to my level, bring you up to the leader's level, constantly lifting you to the point that you and I could exist in a world of mutuality, commonality and equality. And that's a critical thing because if as a leader, you are constantly seeing your little members instead of a world of kings and peasants. You see church as a kings and peasant model. That thing will constantly keep the efforts of God crippled in the earth. What Paul wants by impartation, he's describing a world of mutuality, commonality, and equality. And the last point inside of there is this. Impartation accelerates growth. It accelerates maturity, fruitfulness, and productivity. He said, what I want is to come among you and reap a harvest just as I do among the Gentiles. Harvest basically means that things have come to a point of complete growth. It has matured fully. It is now fully productive. When you think about harvest, you are talking about massive productivity. You're talking about increase. Paul said, I want to be down there with you down in Ghana. I want to come close to you. I want, my, I want my relationships with you to be tightened to the point that, listen, you are not just impressed by what I say, but there will be this dynamic junction created because once that connection is made, you could live in this zone where this woman understood. The woman, the woman understood this, that, listen, your my husband's connection to you is more important than his connection to me because whatever he gets from you brings value into my household, you know, because... Uh, that connection to you brings strength, load-bearing capacity. It accelerates growth, maturity, fruitfulness, and productivity. Which family wouldn't want that? That is a serious point right there. Listen to me further. Something I quoted in a, I quoted this in one of our meetings on a Thursday or some part of the world. Listen to what I define as impartation. Impartation is an eternal resource that fans the embers of the breath of lives. I say lives there because... The, the word in the Hebrew <laughs> for God breathing into man and man uh, receiving the breath of life, that word is hey, and it literally is a plural word. An impartation is an eternal resource that fans the embers of the breath of lives and awaken the multi-layered inner life of God that remains dormant by the daily grind and by religion. In other words, an impartation awakens the multi-layeredness inside of you. Now, let me kind of connect that whole issue of impartation and wealth. Listen to me. This is Paul again speaking to the church in Corinth. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, in other words, we bring a spiritual value, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? And that's a serious scripture right there because it speaks into two realities. Reality number one, spiritual impartation deserves material returns. You know, 
when a guy comes to you and they speak to you, so you have Charles or Pio coming down into Ghana and bringing spiritual resource, what your response to that impartation is not, God bless you, my brother, I will pray for you. No, that is not consistent with the Corinthian model. When, when you get spiritual impartation, your response should not be more spiritual. I would pray for you, brother. We are so blessed. What a wonderful message. No, spiritual impartation deserves material return. Your response to a spiritual resource is material returns. And the second point that is more important is spiritual impartation awakens the ability to create material resource. See, we still see impartation as a shaking and a shiver and a hallelujah and all this kind of stuff. And we refuse to understand what this woman understood, what this woman understood. Your servant, my husband, the priority here is his connection to you. That's a massive flow that changes the whole dynamic of my house, she's basically saying. And that brings us to the end of the second point. Let's get to point number three. Point number three. From the wife's perspective, remember what she is saying. Your servant, my husband, a member of the school of the prophets, uh, one who revered God and feared him, he is dead. And listen, our circumstances are dire. And the reason why I put from the wife's perspective, from her perspective, her husband's impartational connection, his covenantal loyalties to her as a wife, his expansive learning from being a member of the school of the prophets, and his godly fear counted for nothing. That's what she was saying. And from her perspective, she has at least a barometer to gauge what she calls counted for nothing. In other words, she went through the whole gambit. My husband, or rather your servant, he lives off the most urgent prophetic anointing on the planet. Your servant, my husband, he's a very covenant kind of guy. He's a man who fears God, and he has been to your school of the prophets, a place of expansive learning and development. All of that stuff counts for nothing. No, try it in another context. You know, he's a man of God. He's He prays very often. He fasts so regularly. He is constantly giving himself to learning and and he is always engaged in expanding his world and his views, et cetera. I mean, good guy on every level, but you know what? Counts for nothing. What is her matrix? She equates that to real issues. Huh? And that is what most of us miss. We sometimes lose the real issues component because we still measure a man's giftedness by, wow, he can really speak by, wow, he's really deep. But what about the real issues? The real issues. She said all of that comes for nothing. Listen, man, your impartation, brother, your anointing and your wisdom, brother, from that woman's end, that counts for nothing. What is the barometer? One, his inability to provide economic sustainability to his family. She says all of that stuff amounts to zero because here we are, at the end of this man's fruitful ministry, he built a wonderful church, traveled around the world and brought value. He has sons all over the earth, you know, real preacher, that guy, dangerous man, built a network, but he is incapable of providing economic sustainability to his family. Real issues. This guy left us in debt. We are indebted. We have nothing. And apart from having nothing, we owe everybody. <laughs> what is her barometer? What is the matrix? This guy is spiritual, he's loyal, he's committed, he's covenantal, but dynamite. What is the matrix? His sons are losing their prophetic heritage. They are the sons of a prophet and they are about to be taken into slavery. So they are moving from prophetic to servitude. Their heritage is being compromised. What is the matrix? The proximity of the creditors. They are very close. <laughs> They are close. In other words, it's not a matter well, where the bank is saying, well, we'll give you until next year. No, the bank is saying we're coming tomorrow. The proximity of the creditors, they are right on your doorstep. That is the evidence that she has that, listen, this thing you're working, you know, what is the evidence? The potential poverty of his whole family. The potential poverty. Yeah, the guy was alive. We don't know what his circumstances were like. While he was alive, he was traveling and preaching and jumping on planes and bringing life. But listen, the, the point is, from her perspective, that thing counts for nothing. From her perspective, she is not seeing value based on how much preaching he did and how much people get stirred and awakened. She is putting this stuff alongside real issues. And some of you in this conversation, you are right there in the real issues bracket, you know, 
the inability to provide economic sustainability for your family. You are currently indebted. Uh, your sons are losing their prophetic heritage. The proximity of your creditors, they are on your doorstep. The potential poverty of your family and the shame of indebtedness, the shame that should be I N, the shame of indebtedness that now seems inevitable. Do you understand? This woman has a very practical outlook on life in her. She's not saying, well, praise God, you know, after building a wonderful church, all the members leaving. That is not her concern. That's important. <laughs> she ain't concerned about, you know, now that he's dead, nobody wants to buy his books, you know. She's not concerned about that. Now that he's dead, you know, the network that he led, people just kind of going to the other apostle across the street, not important. She's saying all of that count for nothing because here we are. When he was alive, he was there running back and forth, hunting, building, screaming, hollering, and bringing home the bacon. Now he's dead. This is our condition. In other words, this woman basically associates functional ministry with the ability to take care of your family long after you're gone. You know, when that scripture says that if you can't take care of your family, you have denied the faith and worse than an infidel, that scripture is not relative to when you were alive only. Even when you are dead, you need to at least maintain some degree of well-being for your household. That's important. Real issues. The barometer, the barometer happens to be real issues. From her perspective, all of that stuff comes to nothing. And you, you understand men are God in this conversation. When it, when, when it really comes down to the real issues, the real rubber hitting the road, your wife would support you and fight with you and build with you and scream with you and holler with you and she'll be down in the trenches. But listen, when those bills can't be paid, she is having some serious conversations. You know, She's having serious conversations. And she is constantly, while she's fighting with you, I promise you, if the bills are not being paid week after week, month after month, she's having serious conversations. So while you are hollering and screaming, these are real issues that we have to be concerned about. All right? Listen to me further. Number four. Now we're going to pull all this together and you see what we're talking about. Hear what she says. Hear what Elijah said to her. Elisha said to her. Elisha said to her, how can I help you? What do you have in your house? How can I help you? What do you have in your house? And this is the issue. The question puts the onus back on the indebted. What do you have? How can I help you? The issue here is not handouts, you know. How can I help you? What do you have in your house? Now, it's important. The question basically goes to what plans do you have? Do you have any ideas? Do you have gifts or competence, you know? Do an assessment of what you have. And uh, now remember, real practical stuff, eh, guys? What, do a real assessment because we need to get down to the real serious conversations. As I said to you, as we near eschatological issues, it comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, it comes down to economics. It comes down to marketplace. It says in that day, you won't be able to buy or sell. The issue is commerce. The issue is trade. The issue is marketplace. That is a serious conversation as we get to the end, you know. And we can't, I said it before, you can't wait for it to rain to start building a boat. Just like just like Samuel was deep inside the trenches of Ichabod, he started a school of the prophets. He started the schools, rather, of the prophets. Six schools scattered all over Israel. That was his contribution to breaking the trajectory and making sure that the future of the purpose of God will not remain in an Ichabod bubble. We need to start think, thinking now. We need to start putting the infrastructure now for a different type of believer who would not just see church as a place where he goes and he gets like a nice scripture uh, interpretation. This is a place of holistic transformational development. And that's what we had to get to. So this is the point we had to get to here. What plans do you have? Do you have any ideas? When she said to Elisha, when Elisha said to the woman, well, what... How can I help you? That's a good question. <laughs> How can I help you? What do you have in your house? And all of you leaders here, all of you young men who are desirous of starting business, this is the critical question. How can I help you? What do you have in your house? Now, this is different from what God said to Moses. What do you have in your hand? No, this is what you have in your house. You see, what is there in your household? Because the word in the Hebrew language describes 
not just like a your hand, your personal possession. He's talking about household. What is in your lineage? What is in your DNA? What is in your inheritance? What has been left to you? What lives inside of you? Because very often, your dreams are not very often based on what you see others doing, you know. Your dreams live deep inside of your DNA, but religion basically blinds you to that reality. Elisha said, what do you have in your DNA? What is there in your, in your lineage? What is it about your father, your great-grandfather? Because you cannot ignore the fact that when God built a spiritual economy in Israel that was deeply embedded upon lineage, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's something in Jacob that is deeply connected to Abraham. What is there embedded inside of a Mark at Beko? What is in his history? What has God deeply embedded in his DNA that he has ignored, paid no attention to, but that thing carries the capability of bringing his household, his family, his community, his nation into a new place of buoyancy? Listen to me further. This is a call when Elisha said, what do you want me to do for you? How can I help you? This is a call for deep search, severe assessment, rigorous scrutiny, and extensive evaluation. Go back and ask the hard questions. Go back and ask the hard questions and start now. What do I have? What skills I have? What competencies, what competencies do I have? Do I have the ability to write? Do I have the capability to build furniture? Can I do electrical work? And dismiss the notion, well, I'm a man of God and I need to go and preach and I'm going to live off the gospel and all this kind of stuff. Listen, some people and the times that we live in may not be able to, to support that. You know, all had to learn how to go and build tents because the economic situation in Ephesus did not cater to his giftedness at the point in time. Very important. Time for deep search. Severe assessment. Rigorous scrutiny and extensive evaluation. That's principle number four. Number five, she said, your servant has nothing at all except a jar of oil. Now, again, you have to understand the perspective that this woman is coming from. Eh? Your servant has nothing except a jar of oil. See, religion has the ability to throw smoke in our eyes. In it. We are living in a place of plenty, but the puerile mindset limits our gaze and reduces us to a myopic demographic that we don't see as much as we have. This woman had no idea that she had an oil business in that little jar of olive oil. She had no idea. Same point. You understand, well, you might look at the little things. Well, you know, uh, I come from a family of academics and all of them just, they could write, but that's not what I want to do now. You may, you may very well be saying, like this woman said, well, I have, we have nothing. All I have is just you know, this little writing skill, nothing more than that. You could be saying, you know what, my family have planted corn, but I don't want to do that anymore. No, all I have is just, you know, I could plant corn. That's all I could do. But I want to be a man of God. Listen, brother, go and plant corn. Go and plant corn and be a man of God as well. What do you have in your household? Your husband was not little some, some little Mickey Mouse in the spirit. This guy had substance, and I'm sure he left something for you, you know. But the question is, do you have eyes to see it? So she's looking at this jar of oil, her entire oil business. And she is minimizing it. All I have is this jar of oil, minimizing it. You see, because we have pigeonholed, listen, because we've pigeonholed the anointing to a church and emotional experience, we cannot see its capability to empower us for life and productivity. Because we think the anointing is, ah, I feel something. I shake and I shiver. Oh, I never heard it like that before. Good God, that is so deep. And we lose ourselves in this little emotional bubble because we have pigeonholed the anointing. We could never see it. This man was a member of the school of the prophets, very loyal to Elisha. He feared God and he carried with him this jar of oil. That was part of his prophetic equipment. And he left that. And you think that all he had was just, well, this guy was a prophet. He left a piece of his equipment here. This guy left a major, major business right there. But because you are blind, you are starving, and you don't know. You see, because we have pigeonholed the anointing to a church experience and an emotional experience, we cannot see its capability to empower us for life and productivity. You see, the jar of oil is the residue of the husband's impartational enabling. And it still possesses life, even after the husband's death. The residue, 
This is part of his equipment. And that thing lives in the family. Remember, Elisha didn't ask what you have in your hand. What do you have in your household? What do you have in your family? Something this man left that I want you to look for. Something your father left. Something your spiritual leader left you. Something that exists there. Go and look for it. There's something there. Most of us are sitting on a gold mine and we are treating it like this woman. Oh, I was just mm, this little gold mine. <laughs> no, brother. You're carrying a lot more value than you think you do. Number next, number six. What I call the, the relational orbit. Very important. Your relational orbit holds the key to freeing you from your indebtedness. Number six. Your relational orbit holds the key to freeing you from your indebtedness. Now, that's a very important point. Eh? Very important point. Hear what? Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors. Now, the, the first point is this, eh? very simple. Your safety at this point is measured by the extent of your neighbors. So if you are narcissistic, you are, you know, so if you're nasty and you're hostile and you're unpleasant and you're so anointed, you can't talk to nobody. You know, you're such a man of God, you, have, you can't relate to anybody. And so you are cutting off your friendships and your neighbors, your neighbors. You now have, now listen, when Elisha said, go around and ask your neighbors, ask yourself, if you have offended everybody, hurt everybody, trampled on everybody, walk on everybody, ignore everybody because you are so important, you don't need this small man. And now your future is dependent on your neighbors and you have no friends. Your network is small. Your network of relationship is small. Listen, brother, you have nothing. Because the issue here is not just the oil that the husband left. The issue here is your circle of relationship. How do you relate to your friends? How do you build your friendships? How do you engage in developing solid relationships? Because uh, the key to your, the key to break free from your indebtedness is your neighbors. Your neighbors, they hold the key to it. The word neighbor there is the word seken in the Hebrew language. And listen, that word seken means any influential person. It is not just your neighbor who's a friend, any influential person. But you have the ability to go and speak to a, a venture capitalist. That's a neighbor. <laughs> That's a neighbor. Your ability to engage them. So you have to understand that deep inside of this principle is not just your buddy, my partner, my colleague. The issue also deals with, do you have the ability to have a conversation with that banker? And you take your ideas and put it together and go and speak to that influential venture capitalist. Do you feel intimidated? Do you feel insecure? Do you feel overwhelmed because you're walking into this office with a guy who is known to have wealth? No, that is your neighbor. Go and borrow from your neighbor, that influential person. The word Satan also means close friends. That's your buddy, your partner, your colleague down the road. It also means your respected enemies. People who may not like you, but they respect you. <laughs> you know, when you read in the book of Exodus, it talks about how Israel went and fornicated with the enemy. That word enemy describes someone who is not committed to your God, but they are described as a seken. Same exact word for a friend and an influential person. It has people who may not like you, but they respect you. They may not like you. You know, I just don't like that fellow. You know, he's tall and he kind of, you know, it's kind of arrogant, but you know what? You have to respect what the man doing. You know? <laughs> those are all part of your neighborhood. This word also means those who are within the scope of your influence. People who live under the, the, the shelter of your grace and your anointing and your influence. That is a serious word. Go and speak to your neighbor, your Satan. And if we are talking about wealth creation, we have to train certain people to how do you put together a document? How do you put together your, 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 um, your job specs? How do you put together an economic portfolio that you can go with confidence to the second? You know, the influential guy down the street that you could want to talk to them because listen, there's not a single business that exists on this planet that may be buoyant and has economic power that did not start at a small level. Steve Jobs dropped out of school and went and started something in, in his garage. Now, that thing is a trillion dollar corporation. You know. It starts off small. And very often the help that these guys got was going to a venture capitalist 
and getting at least the startup capital to get going. Go to your friends. Important, imagine the impact. That should be Elisha, not Elijah. Imagine the impact of Elisha's comment on a narcissistic, selfish, and obnoxious person. So you are living a loner, and the, and the man of God comes and he, he, puts the, he puts you to the test. And he said, go on, God, go on, go on, borrow from your friends. Go and ask all of your friends, you know? Go around and ask your friends. And you suddenly say, but good God, I have no friends. <laughs> I have no friends. I've insulted everybody. I get up in meetings and I trample upon them. I tell them they're worthless. I scream at them. I am hostile towards them. I abuse them and I use them. You suddenly realize that your escape from your condition is dependent on the very people that you've abused. Go around and ask your friends. The sixth principle is your relational orbit holds the key to freeing you from your indebtedness. Number seven, borrowing power. <laughs> Observe Elisha said to her, go and, you know, not, don't just go and, and make friends, go and borrow from your friends. Listen, fundamental principle, never borrow to pay a debt, borrow to invest. If you borrow to pay a debt, you are digging a hole to fill a hole. Nothing is wrong in borrowing. Borrowing is, a, is, is, is an allowable little world. But what must, most people do, they borrow to, to cover the expenses or to pay a debt. And at the end, after they borrow to pay a debt, they still have to pay the debt off. They still have to borrow. They, have to, they still have to, they have to pay off what they borrowed. And so they find themselves constantly in a hole. And so they have to create systems. If you're borrowing to pay off debt, make sure that is enough to almost build a new capital. Never borrow to pay a debt, borrow to invest. Now listen, that word borrow means is you would say out. And it doesn't just mean to borrow. Listen to what it means here. It means to ask and to search out information. It is the same word that was used to describe how the priests will inquire of the Urim and the Thummim. So this was not a matter of borrowing. You would engage the thing and you search out information, pursue knowledge. So when the prophet says, go and borrow, Deep inside of the technology is go and do the research, jump on the internet, spend some additional hours. You want to open a car wash? Don't go and say, well, you know, the guy down the street has a car wash. Explore it. Go and examine, search things out, ask questions. At the end of the day, you should be able to put out a, a, a car wash that is better than any other out there. So when he said, go and borrow, the word seal means ask questions, search out information, Pursue knowledge. That word sale means to put a demand on detailed information. Put a demand on clarity and direction. You want clarity and direction. I told you a while ago, it's the same word that is used for asking after the Urim and the Thummim. So when Elisha said, go and ask, go and borrow. He's saying, well, go to the neighbor across the road and say, listen, what, what, what does an oil company look like? What does it look like? Do you know anybody who does, who is into oil? I have a, I have a jar of oil at home and I'm thinking about starting an oil business. Do you know anybody who does that? So that's, that's part of the exercise here. Ask the hard questions. Go and do the necessary research. Go and get an MBA. Go and do some studies. Engage in a process because remember I told you that the School of the Prophets was seeking to, to affect a trajectory that the Ichabod had created. This was not just an arbitrary place for teaching men to prophesy. This was holistic development, holistic development. Search out information, put a demand on clarity. And that's what we want to get. The issue here, the issue confronts your pride. You know what I want to ask? It confronts your pride. It confronts your ego. It confronts your assumed knowledge because some of us don't like to ask. <laughs> Go and ask your neighbor. Go and ask your neighbor. Every time you see that, you're dealing with your pride. You're dealing with your ego, dealing with your assumed knowledge. Go and ask your neighbor. Here's an important quote. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he said this, one of the greatest challenges in life is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not knowing about the subject to know you're wrong. And that's part of the mindset involved in asking the hard questions, going to your neighbor and asking it because you have to drop your guard. Do not carry this idea that I know everything about this because I have a degree. Don't hold to that position. Ask the hard questions. Let me get to, la to one last point. The power of secrecy. The power of secrecy. Elijah said to the woman, you know, take the oil, go and get the flask and get go and borrow from your neighbor. 
and then close the door behind you. Close the door behind you. What is the power of secrecy? Now, most of us, I tell people very often, even God has secrets in them. Even God has secrets. The secret things belong to God. That's what the Bible said. Even God has secrets. <laughs> Listen, eh? secrets are the constant speaking of, the inner, of your inner voice that cannot be shared with anyone. Secrets. Close the door. Some of you in this conversation understand how when God begins to deal with you, there are some things and some aspects of the dealing of God that requires that you hold those things close and don't talk to anyone. Secrets are the constant speaking of your inner voice that cannot be shared with anyone. And I'm going to put, can't be shared with anyone yet. The speaking of the, of the inner voice that can't be shared. What is secrets? What are secrets? It is the constant sifting of your many ideas, the constant sifting of your many ideas. Now, when I, all of these meanings here are born out of looking at the etymology of the word secrets. Go on, go on the internet. And do some research and look at the etymology of the word secrets. So when I talk about secrets and I say it is the constant speaking of your inner voice that you cannot share with anyone. Because back in the fourth century, when someone could go and say, you know what, my inner voice is telling me you were deemed mad or you were deemed a bitch or you were deemed a witch. <laughs> you were deemed a witch. And so the inner voice requires that, listen, I'm going to hold this to myself because speaking about it too soon could be detrimental to my existence. The word secret speaks to the constant sifting of the many ideas and your consideration and knowing what parts can be spoken of and what parts must remain hidden. Secrets is your ability to sit down and say, I'm going to start a business tomorrow, but you know what? Even in my searching out information, I need to know how to ask those questions that I don't expose too much of my ideas too soon. Secrets, the constant sifting of your many ideas and considerations and knowing what part can be spoken of and what parts must remain hidden. Secrets describes a conversation that you are very deliberate in determining the specific audience. In other words, secret basically means I'm going to talk to... Mm, I'll talk to Dave Cropper about this, but I, I'm going to maybe talk to Dave and give Chambliss a call. But as much as I'm close to John down the street, I ain't going to share it with him. And that doesn't mean that John is not important. Because secrets, the very etymology of the word, describes a conversation where you are very selected with the kind of persons you want in that conversation. Other persons will never know about it, but those few persons will have access to it. That's secrets. Secrets describes the mysteries, the mysteries, those things that nobody know about that linger and what should, be, what should be deeply considered after moments of solitude, privacy, musing, and separating yourself from the crowd. Now, what I want you to do is to take those four definitions there and match that, that against the original Latin word for secrets and how this word came about where you have to sit down and muse and think about things and you hold certain parts of those thoughts close to yourself. Those things remain a mystery to everybody else, but you are ruminating on these issues, turning them over in your mind, and that's a secret. And you choose the persons you share it with. Everybody must have a secret, you know. Not everything you have to open up for everybody. Even your wives, as wonderful as they might be, and guys, you have to know this. This is not something wrong. Even your wives need to understand, listen, honey, I love you, but you know this, I ain't going to talk to you about it yet. You know? <laughs> and if she is sufficiently mature, she will understand, well, okay, I, I, um, I, will, I, will, I, I respect that. There are some secrets that not everybody really is entitled to. You know, the, the popular, who is it by this particular, Al Pacino? He said, you can't handle the truth. There are some people who can't handle it. <laughs> they just can't handle it. And so, final point. Learn to beta test your ideas on a few and don't be too generous and vocal about your ideas. That's what a secret is. Elijah said, after you go and you borrow all these containers, close the door behind you. Don't go and advertise this stuff. People must only know it exists when the product is on market. When you kick the tires and you know this thing is real, close the door behind you. 
don't be too quick to publicize it and you're on the internet long before the product came out and all this stuff well this is like uh john's best barbecue and you don't even know how to even kill a chicken you know hold those things close to your chest learn to beta test your ideas on a few and don't be too generous and vocal about your ideas allow your thoughts to marinate inside of you so by the time your ideas become public they are, they are, they are properly seasoned right now those are 